Great. Well, welcome everybody. I know we're going to have folks kind of moving in here probably over the next 10 minutes or so, but we'll we'll get this kicked off. We are so glad to have you here with our, uh, our final coffee and conversations of the academic year. Uh, it has been a strange one, to say the least, uh, but we are still moving on with these coffee and conversations. Uh, we have a great panel today. Coffee and Conversations is a joint effort of the Carsey School of Public Policy, the uh, Certified Public Managers Association, and uh, the and the, yeah, and the New Hampshire Certified Public Managers Association, uh, and the New Hampshire Bureau of Education and Training. Thank you. It's early. I clearly need to have some more coffee myself. Uh, but we have three great panelists here today to talk about service provision uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I'll turn it over to Frank Nugent to introduce our great panelists today. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Elizabeth, Troy, and Naomi for um, appearing this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, and as it is my pleasure to introduce them, um, Elizabeth Dragon presently serves the city of Keene in the role of city manager appointed city manager for the city of Keene, September 25th, 2017. Ms. Dragon has served in local government since 1998. Prior to her arrival at the city of Keene, she served as city manager for the city of Franklin for nine years, where she was instrumental in various economic redevelopment initiatives. In Franklin, she also performed a lead role in the community's substance misuse prevention initiative. Prior to her arrival in Franklin, Ms. Dragon gained a great deal of diverse experience managing the communities of Bristol and Plymouth. Ms. Dragon has a bachelor's degree in accounting, and before transitioning to management, she worked in the field of finance. Later, she completed the New Hampshire Division of Personnel's Certified Public Manager two-year program. Ms. Dragon is also a credentialed manager through the International City Manager Association, and recently completed the Senior Executives in State and Local Government Program at John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Uh, next, Troy. Troy Brown is, was appointed as the Litchfield Town Administrator in September 2015. He currently manages the day-to-day -day operations of municipal government and the $7 million annual budget. Mr. Brown has over 25 years of municipal experience working in the towns of Limestone, Maine, Londonderry, New Hampshire, Pembroke, New Hampshire, and Hollis, New Hampshire. Troy has worked on brownfield environmental cleanup sites, developed tax increment financing districts, and coordinated construction of town office buildings, fire stations, and athletic complexes. Mr. Brown is a graduate of the University of Maine. He holds a bachelor's degree in public administration and is actively seeking to become a certified public manager through the New Hampshire Bureau of Education. Uh, last but not least, Naomi, currently a town administrator for the town of Ware. She began her journey in the municipal world in February, 1995. Her first position was a part-time planning and zoning clerk Shortly after that, she became full-time as the D Department of Public Works Administrator. Over the years, she was cross-trained and worked in every department in the town so she could fill in a needed in an emergency, uh, which made, uh, made her what the board considered the ideal candidate for town administrator. She's able to collect taxes, issue building permits, register vehicles, assist with planning and zoning, et cetera. In August of 2009, she was appointed as a town administrator. Uh, with the understanding that she continue her education. She started off with Primex's Supervisory Academy, then ran into the state CPS program, uh, followed by the CPM program, which she graduated in 2011. Uh, striving to continue to improve herself, she started uh, at Granite State College in January 2011 and received her bachelor's degree in business management. Uh, she went to school year-round, nights and weekends. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, she uh, obtained her bachelor's degree in 2014. While still in the school mindset, she immediately started her MPA program at the UNH Manchester and graduated in May of 2016. Uh, she also, ha also has her uh, certified public manager certificate and is also on the board of directors for the CPM program. Uh, in her free time, she loves to spend with her family riding motorcycles, ATVs, and snowmobiles. So uh, again, thank you to the three of you. I really appreciate it. And it is an honor to have the three of you here, as well as, as well as Jordan and Nick from UNH. <clears throat> Thanks, Frank. We appreciate it. And yeah, we have some great panelists and we are excited to hear your perspective on this whole situation. And I think a lot of other folks are too. So we're just going to kick this off. I've got a couple of questions that uh, I'll just go around and have each of the three of you answer. Um, and then 
we'll open it up uh, for anyone who's uh, in, in the public that's watching. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A button box. Please feel free to, to type any questions you have uh, for our panel, and uh, we will we'll get to those questions. Um, just because we are socially distancing doesn't mean that we can't still have a conversation in this, uh, in this situation to the best of our ability. So thank you all. All right, so, so the first question, pretty general, um, but from your perspective, what, what have been the biggest changes for you as administrators during this pandemic? And maybe uh, let's start, uh, Naomi, would you mind kicking us off? Uh, so what um, we're um, we're a large community per se, but we're kind of I'll call it a small community. There's only eight people in this office here, and we're kind of spread out. And I think the um, biggest change that I have found is typically throughout the week, um, I the police chief would come by, the fire chief would come by, the DPW comes by, just to kind of fill me in on where we are. Um, and then you know I guess the communication is now more in this fashion or a text message or a telephone call or an email. Um, and for me, I'm more of a people person. I enjoy the, the face to face. Um, not to say that I can't use any of those other tools. It's just, uh, it's been a little bit different. I don't want to say that I'm isolated because I still have the same amount of information is shared with me. It's just in a different fashion. We also have a lot of committees that, you know, haven't been meeting since it started. Um, and we're just barely, we're going to come back to opening the building to everybody on next Tuesday. So we'll try to get back to what normal, try to be what normal looks like, um, which has been some changes here as well. We've learned some lessons along the way. Um, we've learned that there's a lot more we can do online um, and that's what we're actually working towards you know is putting our building permits and other things and using credit cards uh, typically the only one that could use a credit card was um, the town clerk um, and you can pay your taxes online but it's very costly if your tax bill is big so I think the biggest change would be communication wise um, we've made it work but I'm more face-to-face -face, um, and things have been working well so Awesome. Troy, what would you say have been some of the biggest changes for you? <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to be repetitive, um, but sort of on the same situation, um, I'm, as a manager, I'm very much hands-on. Um, I like to have that face-to-face -face communication. So, you know, a, it was a really uh, a big change and a hard adjustment for me to, one, um, actually work home remotely. That was something I've not really done in my career. The town administrators are usually the supposed to be the first ones there at work, last to leave. Um, and, and then to sit down with my staff, which, you know, again, very uh, small staff, um, about eight employees in the town office, administrative staff doing payroll, making sure um, the checks or accounts payables are being processed, the town clerk's office doing what they do with car registrations, trying to um, adhere to the governor's guidance that, you know, we need to make sure we have limited staff um, and we come in and stagger our hours because the fear was that if we lost one or two of our employees, we could find ourselves in a situation where we're really going to be struggling to um, perform our customer services. Our greatest fear, of course, was um, accounts payable and payroll because we process that on a weekly basis and with limited staff. Um, you know, we, we started paying attention um, to really making sure that we, we took the, the employees that were trained in that area and kept them separated um, and protected them uh, as much as possible. But, you know, um, it, again, that face-to-face -face contact with your police chief, your fire chief, your highway workers, um, and in the meetings, that was a real adjustment for not only for myself, but but for our committee members, our elected officials to um, one use software that we really haven't used before, um, and 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 then to try to conduct an actual meeting and conduct business that needed to occur. We can't just stop government. So 
Um, I hate to be repetitive, but that's, that's sort of what's, you know, has happened in Litchfield. I'm sure it's happened throughout the, the country and government. Yeah, thank you. Elizabeth, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I no, I agree with Troy and, and Naomi. Um, I think the biggest change for us has been this, you know, meeting in a virtual format. I have 15 city councilors and a mayor, and it's really difficult to keep connected with them. Um, you know, if they were coming in for a meeting, you'd have just a chat about, oh, how are things going? Something informal to keep that relationship with them. And that's really difficult now where, you know, we're all separated and meeting virtually and there's not a lot of time for just that interaction. And that personal interaction is important. It's not only important with your elected officials, but it's important with your staff as well. And so uh, my department heads also meet um, via Zoom and and that, I mean, it works. We had to learn how to be a little less formal on Zoom. I don't know, something happens when the camera comes on, you're, you're become very formal. And when you're in a meeting with them, you're not that formal. So you had to kind of learn learn how to do that to bring back of that, some of that uh, ease of relationship building. And I think that's been, that's been the biggest change for us and one of the biggest challenges. If, if your elected officials don't feel connected to what's happening, um, it's really difficult for them um, to to be supportive and to um, feel like they're contributing. And so that, I think that's that's the biggest thing. We had a lot of technology already in place, so we had many of our services available online. Um, we just we took an inventory of that and added in um, several departments. Um, we reassigned employees to different um, services that we needed to maintain. Um, so we were able to make all those adjustments. Um, but I'm, you know, I am I'm anxious to get back to face and face with with my department heads and with my elected officials, especially, um, so we can get back to uh, the relationships that we have built over time and and move things forward. Uh, can I just add, Jordan, uh, Elizabeth uh, hit on something that's the relationship um, that's really key here. And you have to understand the timing of COVID-19 when we started to you know, shut down our town offices and, and meeting face to face. It occurred pretty much the same time that we just had uh, state elections. And so we had new elected officials that just got on board. I have two selectmen that um, for about a month I, I did not meet. I didn't even shake their hands, met, met them face to face. Um, so there was a little bit of a struggle there for the first month, just with all of your new elected officials. Absolutely. Trey, I had two. I'll raise your three more. I had five <laughs> new city councilors in, in January um, and a new mayor. Um, and so, you know, it was very difficult um, to, we'd only had a few meetings together. Um, we hadn't had a lot of time and, and, and they, you know, they were just getting used to how government works and we changed all that, so. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, and of course it all happened so fast, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a quick transition to something new. So a lot of these changes seem like they've been fairly challenging. Uh, have any of you found opportunities within some of these changes? Uh, are there any positives that you see kind of coming out of uh, some of the alterations that you've had to make? Yeah. Yeah, Elizabeth, you want me to like start? To yeah. Sure. Um, so, so I don't know if this is a positive or not. I guess it is. Uh, I can meet more. I don't have to travel from one room or one building to another. So my meetings are back to back. Um, that's a, both uh, a good thing and a bad thing because I don't get out of my office enough. Um, but you can do more things. You can engage. You can participate in something like this. Whereas a trip from Keene would have been difficult for me to squeeze in to participate in the coffee and conversation meetings. Um, the other thing that I have found is you know, when something like this happens, you become very aware of your ecosystem and how your organization fits in with the other organizations and the importance of everybody 
working together. So we have been able to build stronger relationships with our business community as we've worked with them to find ways to help them, uh, whether it's use of city sidewalk, uh, changes in our parking, setting up parking loading zones so that they could do uh, pick up and drop off for restaurants. We really had to engage with them uh, and, and ask them, what do you need from us? What can we do? And then we had to be creative. And so that I think has been a huge positive. Um, we've also had the opportunity to experiment with things that we've been afraid to do in the past. I mean, it takes uh, an act of city council to change an ordinance and uh, adjust parking. But during this emergency, we had some flexibility um, and we were able to make those changes. And if something didn't work, we could change it again. Um, so I think that was a positive. I think the fact that people started thinking creatively um, and and stopped um, thinking uh, about only the things we've done in the past and started working together to brainstorm things that we might be able to do in the future. And, and that's really been positive. I've seen our community opening back up and, uh, you know, businesses opening up and doing it in a very safe way. Um, and it's exciting. Uh, so so there has been some positives for sure. Yeah, I would, I'd, li I'd like to add that um, a couple uh, great positive things and opportunities that have come out of this. Um, one of the things that um, has been very evident is the team building that's that's happened with department heads and our staff and 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 the board of selectmen. Um, I've never had such uh, a great team, uh, and the communications actually hasn't been better. <laughs> it's it's just awesome. We we are we we meet. Um, you know, via WebEx, uh, uh, we were meeting three times a week. We've backed it off now to, to one meeting a week. And we have our emergency management director, our IT director. We have uh, two selectmen. And we um, troubleshoot uh, all the issues that come up. And it's great to get input from your librarian who um, are great problem solvers. And, you know, prior to COVID-19, um, probably some of these issues and that have that come up, we wouldn't have consulted with uh, the employees, the depart certain department heads, probably gone directly to a fire chief, a police chief. Um, so the input from all of our employees has been very helpful in addressing this as we're in a pandemic. So our communication has been great. The other thing is um, through the federal grants that have um, come available, We've been able to, because of our operations, we knew we had these limitations to our um, infrastructure, our buildings, things that we we should have had in place probably um, prior. Um, but you know, just simple things like having our um, doors, uh, the, the entrance doors to our town office. We just recently installed equipment so that we can operate those doors remotely. Um, so we have two customer transaction desks, the uh, administration building department. And then another one where the town clerk tax collector. And we've just installed this last week because we're anticipating opening next Monday. And we're going to, you know, actually just allow a certain number of people in the in the lobby area. Fantastic equipment. Uh, we're set there, have a video conference with the person at the door, make sure they have a mask, make sure they understand the rules. We'll allow that person to come in and we do all that remotely from our workstation, protecting the employee protecting the customer. Um, and you know, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but we never had an outside um, Dropbox. So, um, you know, we've just recently had that installed. So uh, people can now drop things off to the town office 24-7. Um, so we've created some better opportunities, customer services for, for the citizens. And we don't have a lot of business in Litchfield. Uh, very limited. It's pretty much a residential agricultural community. But I hear you with the connection. I think that we have connected more with our community than we ever have. And it's come in the form of when everyone was home and they were, you know, reaching out to us, looking um, uh, for things to do. And, and, and you know, um, we started making them aware of all the recreation areas that we had, the trails. Um, we have a beautiful bike path. Um, and, you know, initially we closed down all the parks and facilities, but then started from their feedback, started easing some of those restrictions so that there was social distance in place, but they could still recreate. So we, I feel that we did really 
um, connect with our community more than we ever have in the past. So I'll add, Troy, um, don't feel bad. We only put a drop box outside just now, too. So <laughs> during this, so you're not alone. Um, our building, too, is 200 plus years old. So, you know, we've made some improvements. We haven't done a lot. Um, and it's a small waiting area. But, um, you know, I think we've got signage and things like that that will make it work. Um, we also don't have a lot of uh, business. Most everybody commutes out of town to go to work. We don't have any sidewalks. Um, but one thing I will tell you that um, we have the food pantry in the basement here at the town office. And what we have found is, um, and I'm not saying that we didn't communicate well, but our communication with the school administrators has stepped up hugely because um, A, through the food pantry, the kids are getting meals. They've delivered 1,900 meals to the families, which includes seven days a week. Um, and the community as a whole has stepped up, whether it be donations of checks um, or just food in general. Um, I think we've really worked together to uh, really um, to take care of the community. But there's people that you've never heard of that have asked what they can do. And I think um, as as small communities, we're all in this together and we know um, there's sacrifices being made by a lot of people. And um, those that help want to help those that, you know, need the help. So I think largely um, I've had a good relationship with the school, but really because the schools have been closed. So they've asked what they can do um, supply wise or anything else. And it's, it's been a good thing. Um, and I'm hoping to keep it going and not once we get back to whatever normal is to I don't want to see that go away. And I'm going to do my best to keep that working with us because we're across the street from the middle school, which is a huge, um, but they've all stepped up and asked what we needed. Um, but I, I really think, um, and Liz hit it too, the more meetings. Um, unfortunately, you can attend meetings now at home or the office, so <laughs> whether you're in your pajamas or your clothes or whatever. But um, I too have found that I have um, attended more meetings that I wouldn't have been able to step away from because I can take 45 minutes to an hour to join in. And, and keep myself informed. But um, I think we've, we've done well. Um, I think we've all doing well, all the communities are doing well and, and I appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's great to hear, uh, you know, even in a time when we're sort of pushed apart that people are working harder than ever to stay connected. That's, that's really cool. So uh, the next question I have here is, uh, and, and maybe we'll we'll go back reverse the order again and start with you, Naomi. Uh, can you walk us through your process of kind of coordinating municipal services during COVID-19? Uh, what does that process look like? How has that kind of changed from, from what it was before? Um, I think we've touched on a, a bit of it. Um, you know, when, when we decided to basically close the building, we had to kind of pull in our department heads to see how we could still provide a service that the community needed, but at the same time, making everybody safe. So, I mean, it did take some coordination by pulling, I'll call, I hate to use the word essential, non-essential. Um, I think everybody's essential. Um, if you were non-essential, I'm not sure why I would keep you, but that's my personal opinion. Um, essential, you know, is pull them all together like the clerk and, and what do, what can I do for you to continue because people need their car registers. And I do know that the state stepped up. If you bought a new car, they gave you an extension on your 20 day plate. So people didn't get really crazy over that, but it did. And not that we wouldn't do it in any emergency is pull all your, um, main department heads together and, you know, share ideas of how we can still perform business at a safe pace, at a safe rate to keep employees safe. Cause as Troy said earlier, I'm a small office too. So we did the staggered schedule because losing one, I mean, you heard from my bio, I'd end up doing somebody else's job plus my own, but that's, that's what it's all about. Um, I just think that, I mean, during anything, largely the most important thing we did was we pulled everybody together and they shared between the police chief, the fire chief, DPW, we shared them all in one area to see what we can do to keep business. And we kept that communication open. Um, 
I can't really pinpoint you a step by step, but that's where we started. Um, and it has worked well. And uh, I think both of them have mentioned communication with the department heads, although it's been different. I mean, we've we've communicated seems to be a lot more. Troy? Yeah, the same message. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not going to um, kind of repeat what was just stated, but the same message. And it was um, I can remember it seems like a long time ago, but remembering when all you're coming home and you're, you know, you're watching the news and you're hearing this out over in China and not really paying attention. And I just, you know, the day that we had the um, department head emergency meeting with our whole financial emergency management team. Um, and I was, you know, coming out of that meeting, knowing that what we just discussed was that we were going to have another emergency meeting with the board of selectmen talking about closing down the town office building and, and really shutting down all, you know, government throughout the whole organization that wasn't essential. Um, i would never ever been in that uh, situation before at all. I mean, I've been through Mother Day floods, I've been through ice storms, and um, you know, we kind of shut down for three to five days. And the biggest priority is making sure the generators got fuel coming, and uh, <laughs> and all your buildings are, <laughs> you know, got the fuel tanks are full, and and we got warming shelters and stuff like that for for our residents. So this was all new, and um, but. But it was just great communication. Uh, yeah, just with the school. School officials played a big role in this. Everyone did. Um, and like I said, we met three days a week and we worked through it. Um, it was a lot of hard work uh, the first you know, month. Um, just, just trying to you know, really get the message through. Because you have to remember, the first couple of weeks of this, people are still shaking their head, kind of wondering what's going on. So even your staff kind of scratching their head and saying, what, what is going on here? You know, and um, I can tell you that I'm absolutely amazed by the residents, um, the taxpayers' response to all of this. They have been so open, so understanding, and so cooperative. That That is what shocked me. I really thought we'd get a lot of pushback um, from taxpayers when you start closing the doors of town hall. But Liz? So it seems like forever ago um, <laughs> when we first heard about COVID-19. Um, and the first thing that we had to do was identify who was the emergency management team. It's a little different than a flood. Um, in this instance, the health officer was part of that team um, and has played a critical role um, the next thing that we had to do was pull out a pandemic plan that we've never used before and say, does this actually make sense? Um, we've never had to, to implement a pandemic plan. So we did some work initially on that. And then setting up a communication plan. How are you going to communicate with the elected officials? How are you going to communicate with the community? How are you going to communicate with the staff? So we set up uh, more meetings. Um, more meetings for staff briefings related to COVID. We, um, the mayor stepped up in his role um, and took the lead in communicating with the council to allow us to manage the day to day. So we were pushing information to him that he was then sharing with the council and the community and answering the questions as the face of our community. Mm -hmm. So that was really helpful. Um, the next thing that we did, and I agree, Naomi, it's very hard to talk about essential employees or essential services because all of them are important, but we did have to go through that. We were forced to go through that exercise to decide which services needed to continue. And people don't think about the transfer station, but if your transfer station shuts down for three months, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have health issues and all other issues. So we had to come up with plans, <clears throat> excuse me, to keep those going. Obviously, we had to move to the virtual uh, meeting format. The first one we had, we were bombed, um, figured out quickly how to uh, address that so we weren't bombed by hackers. Um, and then we had to look at all of our buildings, modifying all of our buildings. Um, and, you know, we looked, we started doing that before we knew if there'd be funding sources for that, hoping that we would get FEMA funding. But following funding sources, been a full-time job in itself in determining where things go, what qualifies, how much of a match you need to have. Um, 
<clears throat> we also spend a lot of time monitoring positive cases of COVID in Keene and in Cheshire County because if those change, um, then we need to adjust our policies accordingly. So we meet on a regular basis um, via Zoom with the hospital as well to understand what they're seeing and what trends they're seeing. Um, we had to do a, little, a lot of work on personnel policies. Um, I realized the federal government was trying to help us with their Families First initiative, but that put us in a tailspin because we had already put together a plan to address that and to look at sick time and sick time usage and what we would need to do um, for our employees. And then we had to get rid of it all and fix it and create something that met the federal guidelines. Um, so we did that. <clears throat> then we had to analyze our budget and say, what's gonna happen to our budget? What revenues are gonna change? So when nobody coming downtown, we had no money coming in for the parking fund. The parking fund is not through our general taxation. So we had to look at modifying our services in parking to offset some of that loss. And then we spent a lot of time strategizing, um, strategizing purchases. Um, so what, what could we do to make sure that we were ready for any potential grant funding sources, sort of anticipating what we've seen in the past and, and what we might be able to do. So we did a lot of work at adding our projects to the, to the SEDS plan, um, so that we'd be eligible for, if money comes down in the future from USDA for funding for some of our projects. We had to engage with the homeless, um, shelters. We have a few homeless shelters here in the community. How does the homeless um, physically distance themselves? If you've been in one of those shelters, you know that they're next to each other, head to toe, um, and there's not a lot of room for that. And then what happens if you have an outbreak there? So we needed to come up with a plan for them as well. Um, spent a lot of time listening to the governor, sometimes in the background, but he would always surprise us with a Friday uh, announcement, which then we'd had to hurry over the weekend to adjust to make sure we were ready on Monday morning to go. I'm happy to say yesterday he announced he's now on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I think he heard from enough of us saying, please stop ruining our weekends. We need to have this information a little sooner. Um, and so we also, you know, very engaged with the state of New Hampshire and their emergency operations team on their Monday, Wednesday, Friday calls. We had to set up an alternative care site here in Keene. Um, and so our emergency management director, which is our public works director, took the lead on that. The city partnered with Keene State College and the National Guard and the hospital to set up an alternative care site. Um, thankfully, we never had to use it. Knock on wood, I hope we never have to have that need. Our hospital capacity was enough, but we weren't sure. So we were one of the 14 that set, uh, set up uh, one of those locations. Um, and then we did a lot of sort of anticipating so that we would be ready. Parks and Rec is ready to kick off their modified COVID-19 summer camp. Um, and that'll kick off when the governor, um, I think it's June 15th or right around there, announced that we could open. It's really important. If you're going to get people back to work, they need child care. But it's not easy to provide um, the, the summer camp program in the way that that we need to, to protect the, the children attending and the staff. So we had to make a lot of modifications. We had to make, move people around. We had to do additional training, put in a lot of additional protocols. Um, and then, let's see, I just think constant problem solving. Um, you know, we've been dealing with the pandemic um, and we've been doing the budget and we have new city councilors and we have now, a very active community protesting. We had a very large protest here. Um, hundreds of people came to Keene for the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protest. And there's a lot of work that goes on to prepare for that To um, You know, you, you hope for the best, but you prepare for the worst. And so in the midst of all this, um, we've had to do some, some work around that as well. And we've been very fortunate at everything Again, knock on wood, I'm a little superstitious to say it, but everything has been, has been great so far. People have been very respectful. But think about the amount of stress um, for the staff. We have staff members that have been on 24-7, seven, seven days a week um, since this began. And now we're doing this as well. And 
it's very difficult for them to disconnect. Um, they're on their email. They have to be available if something pops up um, nights and weekends. And so for me, I'm concerned right now about the emotional well-being of our employees and making sure that we are getting enough time for downtime um, and making sure that we are supporting them in the way that we need to. And and I think that's really important um, as we move forward. And um, so that's where we're at right now. Um, and it's going to continue to change and evolve and we'll continue to adapt and evolve as, as, as it does. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty, um, positive at the moment. Our numbers here in Keene have been very low. Um, even with the opening of restaurants, which we had people out on the sidewalks the first day that that was allowed. Um, and we haven't seen an increase. So I hope that that remains the same and we can work to come back to whatever our new normal will be. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go back to Naomi here and go around for, for one more question here before we start taking some uh, questions from the public. Uh, what's what's one aspect of the pandemic uh, in, in your experience with it that might surprise residents that aren't that familiar with municipal government? Uh, well, one aspect is the, uh, I think, <laughs> let's, I'll try to phrase this. There's, um, so the amount of information that we can provide without having the face-to-face -face is, was a surprise to a lot of people. Um, you know, we don't have a town Facebook page, but the police department does, the library does, um, and parks and rec does. So if we needed information put out there, that was an avenue. Um, we have a website we've got, um, on our website, you can e-subscribe. So I was funneling information as it came across. Um, the fire chief was doing the same. And then the amount of, I said before, we weren't quite as prepared um, as far as the building permits and stuff. But um, I think there was a surprise that, oh, I can do my registration for my car online. You know, oh, I can pay my taxes or I can get that online. If you email it, you'll email it back. You know, there's a lot more. But then I take a step back and I look at someone like my parents who are in their 80s that they don't even own a cell phone. So for them to go register a vehicle or anything is like they were paralyzed. So, you know what I mean? It's a good share of everybody's communicated that way. And one other thing we've done here is we do. Um, the fire department is great about maintaining a list of people that we can check on. So, um, but back to that, I think the more, there's a lot, people didn't know that they could do a lot of this. I mean, let's face it, today's world, um, nobody carries a checkbook or cash anymore. So they come in here with debit cards and credit cards and everything else. So they weren't sure they could do everything online and they're thrilled to find out that they can, because just like us attending meetings and sitting at our desk. I mean, they can go online at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night and register their car. Um, so I think that was as much, you know, the communication has been better. Um, it's unfortunate it took something like this to do that. But uh, I believe, you know, the whole idea of what they can do with us remotely and still function and still have their car registered or their taxes or anything else. And the drop box out front has been huge for people because on their way through town, either home or back, they can stop by and drop it in the box. We can process it and we can send it out. So I think there's just been a lot of um, things that have come to the top um, largely for this pandemic. But, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm face to face and I hope that we don't continue that way. But, um, you know, that's what I think the residents were shocked at how much service we could provide through online. Makes sense. Try anything that might surprise folks. Yeah, the, you know, the greatest surprise that we had in Litchfield, um, you know, we, Litchfield takes a lot of pride in itself. Um, like I said, it was a residential community, very limited business. Uh, it's a place where people want to live, raise their, their children. And um, so they take a lot of pride in their school system. They wanna make sure they have a quality education, a quality police department. They want those emergency services from the fire department, ambulance services. And, um, but the, 
the two surprises that really uh, we all talked about during our emergency management meetings, the one that came uh, and showed its face very quickly was our solid waste and transfer facility. So, you know, our, we don't have, we don't offer curbside pickup. We have a traditional facility where you'll bring your waste and your recyclables, your brush, your appliances, all to one facility. And what happened, I, I don't think this is a surprise because I think we all did it in our own, you know, we had some time on our hands and uh, everyone's at home. And what a perfect time in March and April to start doing some spring cleaning, cleaning out that shed, cleaning out that garage, doing yard work. And we didn't see this coming at all. And I remember Saturday afternoon, the phone call from our solid waste director saying, Troy, um, you know, I, I can't even explain to you what just happened to us down here today. It's going to take us two days to recover. Just we don't even have enough containers for, for the material we just took in. I've never seen this in my life. And so we quickly had to have a, a meeting Monday morning and, and wrap our hands around the, the transfer facility and, and put together um, a plan of action because it was very evident that that was an area that we, we, we just didn't see there being any problems. And it continues to be um, still a number one area that we, we, we still have to tweak we had to expand hours. We had, uh, you know, we had a, a system where folks were coming in and they parked their cars, the offload ramp, and you know they're only it's like a parking lot, market basket. So you're you're getting out of your car and you're you know a couple feet away from a customer. So we had to rearrange the traffic flow, the number of vehicles that could be in in a certain area. It was a lot of work, and it still continues to be a lot of work. We're very hopeful that when the 4th of July comes, that things are going to calm down. <laughs> but um, So that was a big surprise uh, for a small residential community. And I think that's probably a message you'd hear throughout the state. Two, um, it shouldn't be a surprise. But I, I think a lesson learned from, from uh, all of us is that our residents um, in these, these modern times, they embrace technology. They want to do virtual commerce. They could care less about really physically coming into the town office to register their car, or pay their taxes, or to register the dog. They want to do it online. So I, you know, I really think I know me as as a manager. <clears throat> I'm going to pay a lot more attention to this as I work with department heads and put together annual budgets to make sure that we're doing everything possible to invest in online commerce. And I think that's that's the way of the future. That this pandemic will uh, one of the changes that we're going to see coming out of this will be a lot more of these remote meetings of using the, you know the electronic means of communication uh, live and um, increasing our electronic commerce capabilities. So, Troy, we had the same thing happen at the transfer station, and we also had to adjust our hours. People were home. And they were looking for things to do. made a lot of sense. Um, I think the one thing that um, people probably are, didn't realize that the city is so involved in many other things. Um, so, for instance, they're, they know about your visible services. They know you're running an ambulance. They know you're going to have a fire truck and a police officer but they're not really as aware of the health, health officer role or some of the other things that the city does that's less visible to the general public. So I think those things have become more visible, which is a good thing. I think it helps people to understand um, the services that your, your city or town are providing. Um, so I would say that would be one of the big takeaways in terms of what I, what I have seen from people. Oh, and maybe, and I think maybe um, people who, the businesses who have been working with us, um, they have had an opportunity to understand why we can and cannot do some things and where we can make some changes. Oftentimes when the city is saying you know, no to something, they're just, they think we're just trying to be difficult, um, but there's a justification behind it. There's a reason. So when you're actually problem solving with those businesses and walking through that process with them, they're like, oh, 
I didn't realize it takes 16 employees to shut down the square and um, it takes three hours to set up for those detours. I mean, just those sorts of things, a greater awareness of what, what the city does and what it takes to do certain things. Uh, just to follow just uh, one other thing, our transfer station too, um, Troy, you mentioned it. I think everybody's at home doing their own thing. We actually had to, we contract our waste to be hauled away. So we had to actually step up and do it almost every day or twice a day to get the trailers out, um, the demolition, particularly for the projects. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably one of, uh, as well as ours. Thank you for bringing that up. That was one of our things too was, the transfer station was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? It's full and it's only six hours into the day or something. So, Yeah, that's really interesting. I It makes total sense when you say it, but I, yeah, I never would have thought about that either. So we have, uh, we got a few questions here from uh, members of the public. Uh, other folks, feel, please feel free to uh, type any questions you have into the Q&A box here and we'll get to as, as many as we can over the next half hour or so. Uh, so the first question we have is from Jonathan Kipp. Uh, he is on the Londonderry Budget Committee, and he's curious to, to hear your thoughts on how budgets and finances have been impacted by the pandemic and some of your predictions for the future. So feel free, whoever uh, would like to take that. I'm happy to answer, but Troy, do you want to? Uh, no, we'll let the city go first. They, yeah. <laughs> well, I spent a lot of time. Remember, I was a finance director before <laughs> becoming a manager. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at the budget and preparing the new budget for July 1st. And um, what I have seen um, is the expenses that we've incurred have all really been covered by one of those fund, any of the various funding sources that are available. So Initially, people were concerned that we had to buy all of these things to make these adjustments, and then where were we going to find the money? But that's we're getting reimbursement for those. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, our big concern has been related to the state of New Hampshire and any adjustments that the state or the governor makes to revenues that are that come down to towns and cities. And he recently has made uh, an announcement that he has no plan to adjust or change the meals and rooms and some of the other revenues that come to us. So again, that you know that puts us in a good, pretty good place moving into our July budget. The, the big issue that we have um, is related to our parking fund, which is a self fund, not not through our general taxation, and that's based on you know based on activity. And obviously, without the activity, um, that is a fund we had to make some adjustments to. Now, I will say. I'm concerned not so much about the budget that starts on July 1st. Hmm. I'm more concerned about the following year because we've got the governor saying he's going to keep us whole. We've got all these revenue funding sources coming in to help us off offset expenses. Um, so we're, we're in a good shape moving forward. But then move into the state's budget year. Um, that's a two-year process. And I am concerned about if the if the state does not re, um, recover as quickly as we hope it does, um, it won't have the revenues and to uh, give to the local communities. And it'll be then that they'll make adjustments, in my estimation, it'll be then they'll make adjustments to the revenues that come to the towns and cities. And that's what we'll need to be prepared for. Um, and also we'll need to monitor things like our New Hampshire retirement system. It's a huge part of our budget and it a piece of that formula is based on um, the investments and the return from those investments and if we don't recover and right now it looks like we are but if we don't recover from the stock market um, dips that we've seen that will impact us in our budget when it comes to New Hampshire retirement so going into the next budget I feel pretty good uh, for the for July 1st the next fiscal year it's the following year that I think we're gonna have to look at uh, and make sure that we're monitoring um, all of the potential impacts. I, I agree with uh, Liz. That's, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, at first, when this started, there was uh, gloom and doom. You know, we were going to have um, have to have a special town meeting to resend some of the appropriations that we just approved in March. Um, but over time, I think I've built up a little bit better confidence that, that the state revenues that we plan to receive, we will receive. Um, 
and everything's looking um, as in regards to revenues, everything's holding uh, the predictions fairly well. Um, the interest rates on our in investments have dropped. Um, that's one area of concern. Um, and of course, the expenses, we think we're going to get reimbursed 100% for everything that we've committed to to fight the, the pandemic. Greatest concern I would have, uh, Mr. Kip, um, out there in Londonderry, and I think any, any uh, city or town in the state is going to be your next budget year. That is of great concern to me. I, um, I don't know what the impact, the long-term economic impact of this pandemic is going to be. And my fear is that we're going to start to see that. Um, we see it now. And then, you know, is it going to carry on for another 12 months, another 24 months? And on a local community, <clears throat> we rely heavily on our car registration fees. We receive about $1.8 million a year in car registration fees. And if people, if the economy gets tight, people stop buying those new vehicles. Um, you know, we collect less revenue every year on um, car registrations. And if the state revenues start to have an impact because, you know, um, they just, because of the economy, they're not, they're not going out to eat. They're not staying at hotels. They're not traveling as much. Then we will see an impact uh, on that as well as a reduction in the, our meals and rooms tax revenue that we receive in the state. And um, at our road, our, the road tax, you know, the use of fuel, uh, at the highway block grant funds that we receive that helps maintain, I mean, it's the backbone of maintaining our streets and highways in our town. If we start seeing, you know, people just not traveling as much, um, staying at home, um, you know, we're, we're going to feel that. But we won't feel that impact. My budget is a calendar year budget. So, you know, in a few months, I'll be putting together a proposed budget for January 2021. And as a manager and working with department heads, I I'm going to have to be extremely conservative on my revenue estimates. And if I cut back revenues um, and we don't cut back the expenses at the same level, mm -hmm. then you're talking about an increase in, in taxes. And if the economy is not doing well, people are not going to want, you know, budget committees and, and counselors and selectmen are not going to be prepared to put together budgets that are proposing to increase taxes. So I think that uh, out there for the general public, people that are in the municipal government, I think that's what we're going to start hearing a lot over the next six to eight months will be the proposed budgets for the next round. It will be school and town and county discussions and state. Uh, yeah, so... Um I mean, I'm a calendar year as well. Uh, we were worried about the rooms and meals a little bit, um, as well as he uh, Troy touched upon the highway block grant because we depend a lot on that. Um, the one thing that um, we've just put our tax bills out. So the one thing that I'm a little, we were two weeks into the tax bill. Um, you don't know how this affects everybody's at home. Are they working? Are they not working? Um, I worry if we're still going to get the same percentage of people that pay their taxes on time versus borrowing money. Um, that's probably more my concern. It's funny, Troy, we've seen an uptick because everybody's advertising buy a new car, um, don't pay for it for six months. And then they come in and are horrified and just about drop when they get their town portion of their new car. You know, so we've seen a little bit of an uptick with new cars. I don't know if that's just a trend and maybe they had to get rid of the old ones, but we've seen that because a good we're about almost $2 million in car registrations every year. And we've, we're a little bit ahead of what we would have been. Um, but I think personally, Troy hit it is when we're trying to prepare the budget, if you see this revenue decreasing, you certainly aren't going to increase your expense because then it's born on the back of everybody here you know the taxpayers pay it all which can make a more a situation even worse with everything that's going on like i said in everybody's home life you don't know if paying your taxes before your rent or your mortgage or your car or whatever but um i mean we do have to be mindful going into the fall when we start looking at that or september um when we create next year's budget but i agree that i think a year from now, things might be a little bit more scary. 
Thanks for your insight on that. And uh, yeah, that'll be interesting to see how, how things move along over the next year or so. Uh, this is sort of uh, in, a, in a similar vein of how things are maybe going to change or not uh, from Jen Johnston, this question. What do you think will be your data trigger to return to some of the more stringent stay-at-home precautions? Or do you think with some of the lessons learned, uh, your organizations can pivot easily enough to provide safety to employees and residents while remaining open? For us, the data um, will come from the hospital um, and what they're seeing. And in addition, we have a testing site here locally. Um, and so the, the number of positives, if we start to see an uptick in that, um, because we've made a lot of adjustments to our building, we're prepared for work for home, work from home, we can pivot easily. We've maintained almost all of our buildings um, opened but restricted, um, with the exception of Parks and Rec and the library. Um, so I, I think we can pivot um, much easier now that we've gone through all of this other initial, initial work. I guess I would add to we we are pretty good set up now. We've kind of we've been open from the start, some remote, um, but our town clerk's been open basically by appointment um, to keep everybody distance. But I agree with Liz that, you know, I think it'll be easier now to pivot to it versus feeling like you're in a crisis. At the same time, we're probably going to um, the fire chief keeps me pretty well informed in watching the numbers. He's he's really got his hand on that. Well, um, and that's why we feel we can open and do what we've done and do it safely. But if something goes crazy, we have the ability to shift very quickly as well. Yeah, and I'd, I'd echo the same. We're, we Because we've been through it, we have our plan, policies, and procedures in place, and we've had our building modifications. We can quickly change back to, uh, you know, March. Um, and uh, in fact, I think we can change quickly, but actually um, offer better service. Um, at, some, at a point in time there, services were very limited. So I think we can change quickly, expand services still. Um, and um, the data points that we're using in, in Litchfield, really relying on our emergency management director who's receiving information from the governor's office. So uh, we don't have any large employers or medical facilities in our community that we'd need to keep um, you know, monitoring. Thanks. Uh, we have a question here from Dennis asking uh, if, there, if you've seen problems for citizens, for your residents uh, through, this, through this process. Um, you know, obviously we know some of the issues that have been coming up in terms of, you know, uh, loss of employment and obviously if you if you get sick and uh some of the challenges with, with those types of things have you seen and uh are there any any problems that have stood out for you for your for your residents in town i can speak for litchfield um we one of the things that we did quickly was <clears throat> um we reached out to the community and sort of started a um i forget the term they called it but a neighbor helping neighbor but it was basically a call list that we put together we asked everyone if you're aware of um, an elderly person at home, uh, anyone with medical conditions that we should uh, check on, you know, on a routine basis. So we pulled together uh, a list and between the town office and our fire department personnel, we constantly, you know, check in on those residents. So that's good that we have that in place. And to be honest with you, we, um, it was nice that we checked in on them, but there was, nothing came out of it that there was any special needs. I think um, I am concerned. We just sent our first round of tax bills, um, like Naomi said, out. They seem to be being paid. Um, you know, I think people had escrow accounts, people had savings, you know, in place. Um, I'm a little concerned about the December tax bill. If people have been unemployed throughout this pandemic and um, have lost revenue, and just kind of concern about um, how well if they're going to struggle hard to make those payments in December. And for those folks that are, you know, have a mortgage or they're they're um, leasing, uh, I'm not sure if I'm 100% correct on this, but right now, you know, there's um, during this pandemic, um, I understand that you, you know, 
properties can't be foreclosed on. You know, utility companies are not doing disconnects, and I don't know if people can be, I don't think they can be evicted. So, um, but when those restrictions are lifted and people are way behind on electric bills and uh, heating bills and the lease, that's when we'll start to learn about this. And, and that may not be until September, October. So. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we also had, we, we created a page on our website to match up volunteers with needs in the community. So organizations like the Community Kitchen, looking for volunteers, we did an effort to sort of do matchmaking. Um, we also had a group called the Keen Young Professionals who went to uh, homes of seniors or people who were self-isolating um, to do grocery shopping and other things like that. Um, but what I have seen as a big issue has been broadband. Now, Keen is in a pretty good position, um, but still we have neighborhoods that do not have high speed internet and that makes it very difficult for them to do remote learning for their children or to work from home. Um, and so when, and to make matters worse, we have public facilities like the library closed where they might have gone there in the past to access uh, the computers or the Wi-Fi. So I think that's been a big issue for us. We're having a conversation about how to get all of our homes um, to a point where they have um, high-speed internet. Uh, I think that this pandemic has, has really forced that issue. Um, in terms of um, payment of property taxes, I think it was somewhat con uh, con controversial, but Keen, uh, myself, uh, Durham, and Rochester um, pitched to the governor for the ability to um, waive interest if people do not pay in this next uh, round of property taxes for up to three months. Um, so the city uh, did put that in place. So for three months, if um, people are having a hard time paying their taxes, they will have um, an, an additional three months. Now we had to evaluate, and it's not for everyone, but we had the we to evaluate um, how many of our property owners have um, automatic payments um, set up and escrow. And uh, we had enough escrow payments and, and big property tax payments to carry us for six months. So we wouldn't have a cash flow and a need to borrow. So we had to go through that ana uh, analysis, um, but we felt like that was something that would give people a little more time. I think that we, you know, right now with the, the state of emergency and the, the lack of ability to evict people, we're seeing um, landlords and property owners having issues. Um, so they are the ones that are, are most cases are paying those property taxes. And if they're not able to evict, if people are not paying their rent, then that money's not gonna be able to flow from them. So that, that's something that we have been looking at locally as well. I have to say that some of um, both Liz and Troy touched on a lot of it um, as far as issues we do. And I keep referring to the fire chief because he's my emergency management director as well. Um, he's been with us for a long time and his um, assistant grew up here in town. So we do have a lot of contact. Um, we don't have a name for it, but we do you know, look after, I hate to say the word elderly, but we do look after the families. And then the other connection I have is my health officer is my land use person, which works out really well during this whole thing because she's been extremely helpful. And the lady that runs the food pantry in the basement of my building also works at the school. So I think we have a great connection of all around. So if the school knows of a family in need, we jump to it. Um, if the fire department needs or knows of a family that the health officer can help or, or we can help, um, you know, it's the ones that we don't know about that are very private because, you know, as you age, you don't like to share all your business with everybody. And, and we have a lot of the community as elderly. So I don't want to feel like I'm knocking at the door, but we do. The town clerk is even some of the elderly doesn't want to come in. Um, and so she'll do a lot of it over the phone with them and then they'll drive down, but they don't want to come in and she'll put a mask on and gloves and deliver it to the parking lot. So we've all stepped up to do what we can do. And we don't want anyone to be uncomfortable and we're trying to be as friendly as we can and safe as we can. And I think each of us, Liz and Troy too, I mean, we do what we do 
for the residents. And if we know about it, we'll try to do something for them to make it convenient or make it helpful or we'll get some help. Um, of course, what's going to be thrown on the forefront, which we're trying to prepare for, is what's going to happen in September at elections. That's kind of crazy is our next thing. You know, in November and September elections are going to look totally different. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And I'm sure we'll do fine because we have all the collaboration with everybody. Yeah, thank you. So we have another question here from Christine. Uh, can you talk about how you're managing the use of outdoor town or city owned properties uh, like town common green or baseball and soccer fields? Uh, and in what ways are you enforcing social distancing guidelines? I'll start if you want. Um, we So basically we don't have, our town recreation department's very small. We don't do any of the sporting events. It's done through a private organization, nonprofit called the Wear Athletic Club, or we have a John Stark United lacrosse group. Um, and they have canceled basically all of their stuff, but we've left our fields open um, because I think it's important that everybody be able to get out and do something. Um, you know, we encourage, there's a sign that encourages social distancing. Um, we have kept the playground, um, closed cause we have had it cleaned and now we'll open that back up. But, um, you know, Chase Park, we have Horse Lake, if you want to call it that. We just started on Monday. We're going to open up our Chase Park area, which includes our beach. And we're going to start out. Um, right now we're going to start out at 50%, um, trying to keep the distance and, and kind of trying to do the safest that we can, because I think getting out, um, during these times is as important and to do things. We don't have a whole, I mean, we're probably not as big as any other group, but our fields have been open. Our common areas have been open. Um, I think, you know, I think we're just doing as best we can do. Um, with what we have to do. I mean, like I said, we don't do a lot. It's more another group that does all the organized sports. So that's kind of been put on hold. Um, and they're not going to open it because it's based on the school year. It doesn't preclude someone to take their kids down and throw the Frisbee on the football field or things like that. We've, we've left it open and we're going to leave it open. Yeah. And the, and the story in Litchfield, uh, very similar. Um, we, we have, you know, for the softball and the baseball and the soccer, uh, all of those are organized through associations, so not through the town government. What town does, we provide the facilities. Um, so we, we've closed the facilities um, for large, you know, group gatherings of, you know, 10 or more. That was, we basically had postings throughout the facility saying no large group gatherings. And that was, at, you know, when we first, when this all came out, that's what we we did. We consulted with our police department saying, now, how are you going to enforce this? And and their approach was, look, if there's going to be a problem, we're just going to go up and talk to them saying, hey, guys, you know, uh, your group seems a little too big. We just ask that you, you know, pull it apart or, you know, keep it safe, guys. And And we didn't have any problems, but we did have to close the tennis courts, our basketball courts. Uh, and now we're, you know, we've opened those tennis courts up with a restriction of just um, no more than uh, two players on, on the court. Um, basketball courts are still closed. Uh, and they're, I'm not sure if, I haven't heard any reports from police department that any illegal pickup games going on. I'm sure there are, um, but they're closed. And um, pretty much the softball and baseball seasons just closed just gone. I, I think when the governor came out and, you know, allowed gatherings of, of um, 10 or more, I mean, 10 or less, they, some of the parents were going out with a few of the, the, the athletes and just doing, you know, some practicing, um, but it was very minimal. Yeah, we're very similar. Um, we're not opening our pools um, this year um, for a couple of reasons. We don't feel like we could maintain social distancing at the pool, um, but also we need the staff for the rec program. Um, but basically, we um, we kept our fields open. We have extensive trail network um, available, um, but we closed structures um, like the playground equipment and. 
um, like the tennis courts. And we are gradually reopening them as the guidelines from the governor change. So we did just open our very popular pickleball courts. Um, and yeah. so those are open now, tennis courts are open now. So some of the, 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 the facilities that can facilitate small groups of people are now opening. We still haven't opened the playground yet. Um, and mostly that's concern about keeping it clean and an expectation that we are going to have the staff to continue to sanitize it and we just don't. Um, so, but we're, we're gradually opening and people are, um, ec excited about that. Oh, yeah. and enforcement. I feel bad for the police, um, because, um, some people think we are the mask police. Um, but th what they do is, uh, the state has said very clearly that they, um, they want soft touch from your enforcement efforts. So basically educating people and similar to Troy, the police will go up and just say, you know, you know, your group is kind of large and, and ask them to move along and people have been cooperating. It hasn't really been an issue at all. So, but it's been different, um, something different for them to do. And then enforcement of um, social distancing with businesses really falls to the health officer. But for the facilities, that's been the police department and it's been all just education and communication. So Elizabeth, did you say um, a pickleball uh, facility? Very popular. Yeah, we could we could use more of them, and we have yeah. several already. We, we had a facility which was an old um, gymnasium, and it's used by Litchfield residents, Hudson, Londonderry. Uh, there's an association that uses it. It's pickleball. I've never heard of pickleball in my life uh, until I started working in Litchfield, and it's they must have 80 members active. And that was one of the hardest things to close down, um, but we had to close the pickleball <laughs> court down. Um, but they were very understanding. You may you may need to have a session one day, Jordan, on pickleball. Yeah, so, hey, I mean, you know, uh, it's an up and coming recreation uh, sport that all ages, but uh, it seems to be middle aged and elderly residents really enjoy. We are a graying state. <laughs> It's true. I mean, you know, we're we're looking for uh, for coffee and conversations for the next academic year. You know, maybe maybe pickleball makes its way onto the roster. It could be a new revenue source for communities. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think we have time for maybe one more question here. Um, we've got a question from Peter Clark. Uh, he is UNH uh, MPA, class of eighteen, Carsey School. All right, represent. Uh, he also works for Senator Shaheen. Uh, this question, as Congress looks at additional relief packages, what is the most beneficial action that can be taken to help municipal governments? Revenue replacement. So far, none of the funding sources include revenue replacement for municipalities. And, and I echo that 100%. Uh, we need to be... Uh, assured that we are going to have revenue replacement because that without those guarantees in place, as we begin to uh, monitor our budgets now and make you know, decisions, whether we're going to lift the spending freezes, um, allow certain capital projects to, to move on and um, make those uh, purchases for our police departments and fire departments infrastructure, we, we can't make those decisions until we know what the, the status of revenues are. And as we talked about earlier, as we put together, you know, um, future budgets, understanding what revenue status will be. I guess I don't have to add anything more. I'll just say I totally agree. Um, that's going to be the biggest thing for us as well. Um, I don't need to add any more, Liz and, and Troy said it all, but that's probably, that is the hugest thing of, of us. And, and Peter, find a way that we can make the entire state of New Hampshire have high speed internet so that in the future, if we need to pivot to work from home and uh, remote learning, we are prepared. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, we, we're here at 930. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended and thank you to our fabulous panelists. Uh, I hope everyone is applauding from home. I'm sure they are. We really appreciate having you here.
Uh, this has been a great conversation. I learned a lot. I'm sure that uh, other folks did too. Uh, for all those watching at home, uh, you can share this uh, with folks. It's going to be going up. Uh, the recording will go up on our Coffee and Conversations page. If you go to the Carsey website, uh, you'll be able to, to share this with anyone who might have wanted to watch it but was in another Zoom meeting during this hour. Uh, so please feel free to share widely. Coffee and Conversations will be back. Uh, in the fall, in September. Uh, thank you all again so much. It was really a pleasure hearing from the three of you. Jordan, thank Thanks you. for having us. Nice thank to see you, you Naomi. You, and Jordan, nice to see you guys. Yes. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye. Jordan? Yes, Frank. Can I also thank the uh, CPM directors from Wyoming? And yes, please. We, we were joined today by uh, CPM directors from Wyoming, Rhonda Priest and Shannon Zwei from Arizona State University. So I wanted to thank them for joining us, but also the panelists, they did a great job. Fantastic job, so thank you. Thanks. Thank awesome. you. Bye everyone. Bye. Have a great day. You too.